Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Well, I invite you this morning, let's go in our Bibles. We're in Philippians, we're in the fourth chapter. Today we'll be looking at verses 10 through 13. Paul was a a, a faithful shepherd. He was a good shepherd for many reasons. He was faithful in one way to declare the whole counsel of God wherever he went. He didn't hold back. The church at Philippi had become preoccupied with the wrong things. And he loved them enough to take the time to pen them a letter. It was a gracious love letter. Now in today's study, Paul transitions from the tension that was in that church between two ladies that were not getting along. They were disagreeing. They were at odds with one another. And today he's going to transition from that into a cause and effect. When we stop getting along with one another, then our generosity begins to dwindle. They were struggling to be generous in forgiving one another. And the church at Philippi was struggling to give to the work of the gospel. Our time, our talents, our treasure will be devoted to what we love most. So the question for each of us this morning is, what do I love the most? And the way that we evaluate that is look in your checkbook. Where do you spend your money? Look at your calendar. Where do you invest your time? Look at your life. Look at your average week and what part of that week is offered up to the Lord in the service of his kingdom through his church. So as Ethan just prayed, may the Lord reveal to us the areas that we can grow in grace like the church needed to there in Philippi. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. What is Paul's secret here? His secret to enduring mega joy. Mega joy is that word in the Greek, this great joy, mega joy. And it never ends in Christ's kingdom. And we're going to see three keys to this. And I'll just disclose it right now. It's not really a secret when you write a letter and it goes into the Bible. All right? He found it. But it's not something that you have to pay, you know, high society money and meet on Tuesday nights in the back room and we'll let you know the secret. If you, it's not like that. He wrote it in the word of God for the entire world to know the secret to joy that never ends. And there are people chasing joy and they never find it. Number one, recognize the loving care of others. Keep this kind of list on the people in your lives. The list of what they do right. Notice how Paul emphasizes you here. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. What are we going to learn about this to recognize the loving care of others? First of all, see that Paul was patient with those people. Be patient with the people who are slow to show their concern. Paul was very patient with them. He's an example here of a spiritual father 
And he's waiting patiently for the church. He loved them, and he expects them to get their act together, and he's waiting. He had to wait at length. This is what he says, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. It took you a while, but it happened, and I'm ready to receive it in love. Paul practiced what he preached. He was able to forbear with them. He was able to be patient with them. He was able to put up with them. Why? Because the Lord had been patient with him. The Lord had shown him mercy. Loved ones always begin there. When someone does you wrong, begin, start from the starting point ground zero, I deserve to be in hell right now. Now let me go back again to what did my wife do that I was really upset about? My kids or my, my boss, my neighbors, but I deserve to be in hell right now. It puts perspective on it. It shapes our hearts. And Paul would write to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with them all, bear long with them all, go the distance, be patient. Peter would write in 2 Peter 3.9 of the Lord's patience toward us and still in this day, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Have you ever met anyone that their objection against God is, if God, if there was a God, then why did He let this happen and why did He let that happen? The problem of evil, long discussed, centuries discussed. If there's a God and he's good, then why this, why that? Here it is, here's the answer. He's patient toward you. He's not weak, he's patient. What is his aim? Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach, should come to repentance. And so the very person that is accusing God, blaming God, demeaning God, demanding that God owes them an answer, they're breathing his air. And he is what is holding them out of eternal separation from his presence in a place prepared for the devil and his angels. He's merciful. And so Paul is merciful. So he's patient. How patient are we with those around us? We also see that Paul here about these believers that he loved, believe there will be a revival for good. So Paul was patient, but he actually was patient in hope. He wasn't just buying his time like this is never going to happen. He was believing there will be a change. You have revived your concern for me. It took you a while, but there's been a revival happen. And I'm feeling the effects of this. Paul probably wondered, are they ever going to come around? Maybe parents, maybe you have some kids like this. Maybe you have some grandchildren. Are they ever going to come around? They know what's right, but where are they? Are they ever going to come around? Hey, remember Paul here. He's like a good farmer. He, he did the work. He cultivated the soil. He planted the seed. The water comes. The sun comes. The rain comes. And he's waiting on the harvest and he's trusting the Lord for that. Can I ask you the question right now? Who are you praying for right now this morning? And maybe you're tempted to give up on them. Maybe you're tempted, I don't know. I don't think, I think they might be too far gone. Oh, I don't believe that, but I don't know. Hey, take Paul's example here. Are they alive? They're not too far gone. It could be a day like today. I was there in Traverse City, and there was a lady of a baptism. Her testimony of baptisms, she was in the water, and she said it was right over there, and she pointed to a far section. I was sitting, and that day I gave my life to Christ, and here she is in the water. And that is the reality. It happens that there is someone sitting here today hearing the word of God, and then soon you'll be in the waters of baptism saying it was that day that the Lord opened my eyes. It was that day. Father's Day, 2023, and I traded in, not really, my earthly father with plenty of mistakes, and I received the heavenly father, and it's all mine through my older brother, Jesus Christ. Oh, to be adopted. 
What a testimony. And then Paul moves further and he covers the faults of these Philippians with grace. He covers their faults with grace, with love, with compassion, with kindness. Paul focuses on, he puts all the weight of what he's saying to them under that phrase, it was your lack of opportunity. Is that how we treat people? When you're in an argument with a loved one, you never, blah, 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 blah. You always, blah, 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 blah. Look at what Paul does like a father to these children. He puts all the weight, all his angst and concern on you were just lacking an opportunity. This is what Peter wrote to the church, 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. That's what Paul's doing. He's not excusing their sin. Only Jesus can forgive sin. He's taking it and putting it into a higher court. Lord, you were merciful to me. Why would I not want you to be merciful to the Philippians? Peter, he's writing to believers. Will you just love one another and keep loving one another and keep loving? Don't give up on loving one another. And just cover their faults toward you with love. That you love them more than the, the little thing that they do that annoys you. <laughs> like how they eat cereal. <clears throat> <clears throat> That's me. And Ginger's like, what are you doing? You're like, Is there a competition going on for eating cereal right now? <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> Listen to how Paul covers them. How devoted are we to seeing and believing the best about others? See, it's natural that I see the best in me. Well, that's another funny line we have, you know, in our marriage. You know, all I was trying to do was fill in the blank. I was just trying to, you know, whatever. And there's so many explanations. That go. And it's seeing myself in the best light. And then other people, like, if you really loved me, then you would this, that, the next thing. Do you hear what Paul is doing here? Convers conversion to Christ changes our thought process. We don't care about self first anymore. At least we ought not to. The Lord is delivering us from that evil master. So how then do we cover and at times expose sinful matters? Well, listen to what Jesus said. And you know, today, Philippians 4.13, probably one of the most misrepresented and misapplied verses. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, let's go to another often misrepresented, misinterpreted passage, Matthew 7. Jesus' teaching says, judge not that you be not judged. That verse, who doesn't know that verse now, right? Don't tell me I did anything. Judge not. Judge not. You can't say anything about me. Judge not, right? And Jesus is saying, don't be condescending. He's not saying don't be discerning, you know. Uh, who'd you leave the kids with today? I don't know, some guy in a van dressed like a wolf. <laughs> Jesus said, judge not, honey, you know, judge not. No, you need to use some discernment. Bad move. But he had candy. No, I don't care. For me, not the kids. It was great. <laughs> judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. Now listen to this, because this is the point that is often missed. First, here's a progression here. 
first deal with you. First, get the log out of your own eye. First, wise, preach the gospel message to your own heart before you bring it to people. First, let it beat you up inside and then provide the balm that it also brings to heal you and then bring that. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly. Don't leave the speck in your brother's eye. That's not loving. Well, you said judge not. Don't be condescending. Don't think you're better than you are. You've been shown mercy. And so after you deal with your own heart and you deal with your own hypocrisy and, and, and temptation to be a Pharisee, then you will actually be able to see clearly of how merciful the Lord has been with you. And then you will be able to help someone actually help them take that little speck out of their eye. You ever had a speck in your eye? I remember when Stephen got a little, couldn't see it, fleck of metal in his eye. No one said, come on, it's just a little metal fleck. No, we went to the doctor. Like, get, get that out of my eye, please. But not if you have a log in your own eye. The logs and the specks, they need to come out for us to be able to see, see clearly. Christian love is the love of Christ, and it's radically different than just normal, typical human treatment of others. The love of Christ goes far beyond our faults and it meets us where we are. And I want you to hear this this morning because sometimes people will come into the church, they will come in contact with Christianity and proximity with Christianity and the gospel and they will think wrongly, I need to clean myself up. I need to get my act together. I need to get all straightened up, get the right haircut, get the right language in my mouth, the right thoughts in my head, the right motives. And then Jesus will look on me and say, all right, you're, you're welcome now. That's not how it works. That's not what Jesus did. He went and found people. He met people, men and women, poor and rich, learned and uneducated. He met them where they were. He loved them. And then they confessed him as Lord. And he took them from there all the way into the presence of the Lord. And so who gets the glory? Not us. He gets all the glory. All the glory. John 13, in verse 35, Jesus says this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. What's that, Lord? If you have love for one another. Isn't it better to suffer wrong than to do wrong to others? Think about that. Isn't it better to be the one that others do wrong to then be the one before the Lord that is doing wrong to others, offending other people. This love, it goes far beyond these lists that we keep and, and this is my right and, and, and you did wrong and I remember this and you said that and we keep all of these. Forgiving simply puts it over into the throne room and gives it over to the Lord, covering a multitude of sins, giving it to God. So let me ask us the question then. As we think about recognizing the loving care of others, what would change about our relationships if we functioned the way Paul is functioning with this church at Philippi? This is pleasing to the Lord, and this is also pleasing to those around us. This is where we practice grace, not law. You offended me. You've done wrong to me. This is my law, law, law. But grace for me. No, no, no. This is grace that abounds for everyone. And that's how Paul treats them. He's patient. He, he knows they're going to come around. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm not giving up on them. And so he, I'm just going to cover their faults with grace. You lacked an opportunity. You, you didn't lack love for me. You lacked an opportunity. Let that shape our thinking. Secondly, this key, this secret that's been made public in the number one selling book, is resolve to be content in every situation. Resolve to be content in every situation. Now he, he shifts in this pronoun to himself. Now this personal pronoun, I. He says, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am 
to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. And in and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul makes a resolution here. Notice that he had to make that for himself. He couldn't make that for them. I have to make this resolution for myself. I can't make that for you. I can't make that for my wife or for my children or for my parents or for anyone else. It comes down to a personal responsibility. Lord, prepare my heart and I will, with your help, resolve to be content in every situation. You have to make that choice. You have to choose to be content. And then what flows in is the joy that abounds, this unbreakable joy. Joy abounds in contentment and thankfulness. And often that goes out the window when I start complaining. I can't be complaining and thankful at the same time. Stephen Demzich recommended a book. He said, you know, with this message... This book, I've got this book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, written in 16, I saw the date in here, 16 something. And I downloaded it on Audible and I listened to it, 1648, okay? This book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, Jeremiah Burroughs. Wow. Amazing. The contentment that the Lord gives and what it unlocks in life is like there's a whole nother world. I feel like I've been sleeping under a rock and missing. Great book. We will learn what God expects. Paul said, I am to be content. And I will tell you this, this whole book, you think my messages are long? This book is Philippians 4.11. This is, this is messages on Philippians 4.11, being content. I was like, man, did people sit there? There was multiple messages. I was like, God bless him. I'll just recommend the book. I, w- I won't try to <laughs> compete with that, okay? 1,648, they didn't have any social media. Or I don't know if they had anywhere to go other than animals to take care of. We will learn what God expects. Paul says, I am to be content. So he minimized his own need. He said that he didn't come to the extreme poverty. That word need, it means destitute of what you need to live. And Paul said, I didn't, I didn't experience that. The Lord provided for me. He didn't abandon me. This is the same word that Jesus said when the widow in the temple gave her last two mites that she gave out of her need. There was nothing left. She gave it all. And those in the temple should have said, ma'am, ma'am, here, take that back. Let us give to you. But they didn't because they believed God had judged her and they believed they were helping God pour out judgment on her. And Jesus said in response to that, not do likewise, he said, this is all coming down. This man-centered religion of work for your salvation, it's all coming down. And it did in AD 70, every last stone. Temple was leveled. Every last stone, the Romans leveled it. Paul minimized his own need and he magnified the fruit of his trials, that God was indeed working all things together for Paul's good and for the glory of God. So Paul leveraged here the sovereignty of God to push back, just like he did to the false teachers in Corinth. They were saying, this guy's weak. You ever seen Paul? He looks weak. His face is weak. The guy looks like he's been beaten up a few times. He just really isn't that great of a speaker. He's weak, he's weak, he's weak. That's where 2 Corinthians 12 comes out of. The leadoff that Paul would have, that you and I would use if we were speaking somewhere. Let's go back a week ago. If I had Paul's resume, uh, and now our speaker this morning, well, he's been in heaven. He's had visions with Jesus. You know what Paul leads off with? Three times I prayed, Lord, remove the thorn in, this, in my flesh. And he said, no, no, and no again. But here's what I have for you, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. They say I'm weak. I'll wear that as a badge of honor. I will fly that as a banner. This guy is weak. And look at what God does through him. That's where the power rests. 
John Calvin says it this way. He says that Christians do not measure sufficiency by abundance, but by the will of God, which they judge of by what takes place, for they are persuaded that their affairs are regulated by his providence and good pleasure. It's not by how much we have or by by what we don't have. This demolishes, this text demolishes the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel that is just flourishing everywhere, ravaging the hearts and minds and lives of people on this continent and other continents. Psalm 73, here's what the psalmist says in verse 25. I love Psalm 73, by the way. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my, may, my heart may fail, and in fact, they will fail. But God is the strength of my heart, and my portion, how long? Forever. I won't ever. If I have you, I have how much? Everything. It's all mine. So a quote from this book, Jeremiah Burroughs the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Listen to what he says. The root of contentment consists in the suitableness and proportion of a man's spirit to his possessions. And evenness where one end is not longer and bigger than the other. The heart is contented and there is comfort in those circumstances. But now, Let God give a man riches, no matter how great, yet if the Lord gives him up to the pride of his heart, he will never be contented. On the other hand, let God bring anyone into mean circumstances and then let God but fashion and suit his heart to those circumstances and guess what you'll find? He will be content. One end, not longer. What I want and what I need and what the Lord has provided. He's saying, oh, may we learn contentment. What the Lord has provided, I will be thankful for. So can I ask us the question, church, how content are we? We do realize that this world can, they have nothing to offer that can satisfy, not truly satisfy our souls. It won't last. In the inner person, are we content and Christ-like or are we critical and covetous? What others have, how they've been blessed, that position they got, that should have been mine. 1 Timothy 6, 6, Paul says to Timothy, but godliness with contentment. All right, all you accountants out there, this isn't just gain. He said, this is where it's great gain. This is the best. Godliness with contentment, and you have what can't be purchased, no matter how much money you have. Wasn't it Rockefeller that was asked the question, how much is enough? A little bit more. It's never enough. So loved ones, we will learn what God expects and like Paul, we will experience the highs and lows of this life. Paul didn't hide the truth, but he also didn't embellish the truth. He just leveled with the people that he loved dearly. He said, I know how to be abased. I've learned this. He was brought out. He had a pretty cush life as a rising star in the Pharisee world. He said, I know how to be abased. I've learned this. I've learned how to be brought low. When his countrymen turned around on him, they used to love him, and then they wanted to kill him, stone him, chase him down, give him fits everywhere that he went. He was once persecuting the church. Now they're persecuting him. He was beaten for Christ. He was imprisoned for Christ. He was shipwrecked. He was left for dead. He knew how to be brought to the lowest of lows. That's how that church was born in Philippi, Acts 16. He was at a low point in the prison with Silas. But he also knew how to abound. And this was to have more than expected. That when the disciples got this example from Jesus, and he said, you feed the people. And they're like, how are we going to feed the people? We don't have anything. You know, I'm going to get my calculator out if we had this many people and this much. Lord, we don't have enough to give them. All right, bring me what you have. And can you get them to sit down in numbers, in companies? Give it to me. Give me what you have. Well, here's five loaves and two fishes. All right, give them to me. Put them in my hands, 
And let me give it back to your hands and let's see what happens here today and what happened when it was all said and done. How much do you have left over, boys? Well, we started with five and two. We fed 5,000 plus, uh, plus the women and children and basket one, two, three, four, 12 baskets left over. Well, that's what happens when you put your limited resources into the hands of the limitless God. And they learned that lesson. They learned that, and they would have to learn that over and over again. But Paul knew the joy of having more than he deserved or could ever have imagined because he had been forgiven. And he praised God through it all. He was filled with thanksgiving. He refused to live with a bitter and life-draining attitude of entitlement. If there's anything that is robbing this generation of all joy, it's the sense of entitlement. You are here for me. I'm sorry, that's God. He's the only one that can handle that and is worthy of that. We are here to serve. And that's the shirt we're going to wear at VBS, called to serve. And at the end of the day, servants just say, it was a joy to serve the king of kings. Don't need a plaque. Don't need a mention. It's a joy to serve the Lord. Listen to what Calvin says. He said, if a man knows uh, to make use of the present abundance in a sober and temperate manner with thanksgiving. Now listen. Prepared to part with everything whenever it may be the good pleasure of the Lord, giving also a share to his brother according to the measure of his ability and is also not puffed up, that man has learned to excel and to abound. Isn't that Paul? Lord, you can take it at any moment. And they ended up, they did. They took his head. That's okay. Throw me away to glory. That's all right. Leave me here. I'll tell you about the Lord of glory. Time's wasting that was how Paul lived. And he was willing to work. He was willing to serve. He didn't regard anything that was his as this is mine. I wonder if that's your perspective with what you earn or how you make a living. It's mine. All right, Lord, you can have some of mine. That's backwards. Lord, thank you for letting me have anything that is yours. It's all his. We will then embrace this greatest secret. And this is what Paul did. So he just levels with them. I've learned to be content. I've been without and I've had plenty and the Lord is faithful through it all. Paul endured the extremes of life and he found this secret that he made public to unbreakable joy. And he stays here a little longer. He's drawing out his point. He's giving time for these ladies who are at odds with each other in the church and others who are lined up with them. They're disagreeing with each other. He's giving them time to genuinely consider their attitudes genuinely consider why am I so mad at her anyway? Have I forgotten the main thing? And can we recognize there's no joy in our lives? It's been robbed. Paul experienced times of plenty. He endured times of great hunger. In times of plenty, a lot of people forget God. They live like the rich fool that Jesus warned us about. But God said to him in Luke 12, 20, that rich fool, like, I got barns and more barns. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tear all these barns down and get some new barns. But God said to this man, Jesus said, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And all those barns and everything in them, who's going to get those? Somebody else is going to have those tomorrow, and it won't be you. Are we living foolishly? In times of hunger, people easily can curse God and doubt his existence. If God is good, then why am I suffering like this? Where is God? Loved ones, health, wealth, prosperity will all fly away eventually. We will say goodbye to all of that except what is kept by the Lord. Paul enjoyed times of great abundance. He encountered seasons of need. He was reminded constantly that this life is short, that earth is not our final home, and we are never without hope. So Paul chose to live on mission at all times, everywhere he went, just like Peter did. 1 Peter 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners, pilgrims, campers. We leave for camp next Monday, campers. All right? You're here for a little bit. This will be your bed for a week. 
and then somebody else will be in the bed. You're just here for a little while, so you're not going to take everything. We only have a small trailer. We're not bringing everything. Just bring what you need. That's the same idea. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Very similar to Matthew 5, 16. That they see us as believers and they sense there's something different about us and they repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the day that Jesus comes, they'll be with us and their voice will be added in that number and they will sing It was Friday, but Sunday came. And we're here and it's dark now, but Jesus is coming again. He came back to life the first time. He will come again. We can trust him. We can completely trust him. And that brings us to number three then. That we, like Paul, will repose all of our confidence in Christ alone. Not some of it. Not most of it. But we will set, we will place all our confidence in Christ alone. That loved ones, if you have Christ, he is yours. I am my beloved and he is mine. Kid song, his banner over me is love. Still true. He's ours, he's yours and he is enough. He's all we truly need. And this is where Paul went from you and he covered their, their, you know, lackluster giving and care for him and forgiving. And then he says, here's where I'm at. I am content. I've, I've resolved. I will be content in every situation. How does he come to all this? Because of him. Because of what he has done. And again, this is perhaps one of those most misquoted texts The old rule for Bible study, any text without its context is a pretext for error, okay? So no matter how much, if I go into my driveway this afternoon and I get my basketball and I keep that rim at 10 feet or maybe nine and a half or nine or eight and a half or eight by now, and I say, Philippians 4, through now I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, strengthens me, you know, stretch out. I can do all things. It's probably gonna still be embarrassing, probably not going to happen. That's not what this verse is for. And athletes and so forth, they make this, if they're saying, like those girls from Oklahoma, the softball girls say, we bring it all when we play, and they won the championship this year. We left it all on the field. We play with everything we have, but that sport does not define us. Whether we win or whether we lose, the glory is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're just here, like Peter said, we're just pilgrims. This isn't our final stop. See, a Christian brings it all. They bring their best to their workplace. They don't just say, well, in this world is nothing. No, whatever we do, we do with all our might. Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So that if I'm healthy, to the glory of God. If I am not healthy and somebody else takes that starting position, to the glory of God. That's what Paul is saying here, that my potential is secure. He said, I can do all, and you got to write this word in, these things. This verse comes in a context that Paul was just telling us, all the highs, all the lows, all the ups and downs of life, all the blessings and burdens. I can do all these things and not blaspheme the Lord and not ultimately doubt his goodness, but I can trust him, I can thank him, I can praise him, and I choose to glorify him. God, use my life however you want to use me. That's what he's saying. Do you realize what this does for a believer? So all you're telling me, wise, all I have to do is simply surrender my life, and then the Lord will work out all of these things as I'm in his hand? Yes, That's exactly what Paul is saying. My potential, what is your potential? We just had these little ones on the the platform this morning. What is the potential in their life? God knows. 
And we just pray that they would come to know, love, and follow Jesus. And they would experience what the plan is for God for them in their lives in this one lifetime that passes so quickly. The Christian's focus must be fixed upon Jesus. Just like that chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. How'd that happen? In the light of his glory and grace. That's how that happens. So Paul says, you know, when we're thinking about ministry, and we have this unbreakable relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how we have unbreakable joy. But Paul is honest. In 2 Corinthians 2.16, he says to one, a fragrance from death to death, the other, a fragrance from life to life. And then he just thinks, it just kind of weighs in on him. He's thinking about all of life and ministry. He says, who's sufficient for these things? Like, who is really worthy to stand right here and open the word and present truth and grace to these people? Who's worthy? Shouldn't I sit down and Jesus just handle this? So it's not about being worthy because he answers the question a few verses later, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we, all right, this is Paul, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but here's the key, here's the answer. Our sufficiency is from God. He's the one that supplies. So we're just servants doing what he has called us to do, what he equips us to do by his spirit, and he receives all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because it's all his strength. I can do all things through Christ because his power is sufficient. It's Christ who gives me strength. That's the end of first, or Philippians 4.13. His power. That's what Paul has said. My potential is secure. I can do all these things. Well, how can you do it, Paul? Because his power power is sufficient. He is enough. I'm not enough. I can hardly jump. My vertical is shrinking. It's going away. He is enough. It's Christ who gives me strength. Christ's strength was the source of Paul's strength. Have you, have you experienced this? Are you experiencing his strength right now? You ever worked on a project and you blow a breaker? Oh, man, not enough power. You plug it back in, take some stuff out. Every time we do a potluck here, plug in the crock pot, all, you know, everything winds down. Oh, you got to plug this one in up that way, over that way. And it's like, run the extension cord from down. It's like crazy. Get a generator, whatever you got to do. Why? Because you didn't have enough power. You got to solve, you got to bring more power to the plug. How do we have power? It's Christ in us. This is the secret to our unbreakable joy. It's the power of the resurrected Christ living in us. So the writer of Hebrews says this, listen to this church, keep your life free from love of money. Can I really say that? 2023 in the US of A? That's what people live for to drive it, to live in it, to wear it. Ooh, look at that. Keep your, protect your life from the love of money, which Paul says is the root of all evil, not money, the love of money. And this is what he says, and be content with what you have, for he has said, what will give us this contentment? I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have me, the Lord is saying. God is saying, what more do you need? It's all yours. Yeah, but that wealthy person, look at what they have. But if they don't have Christ, they're paying for it all. It's all yours in Christ. Maybe it won't be realized in this lifetime, but this lifetime is a vapor. This lifetime is short. This lifetime is here and gone. And we're looking beyond this lifetime to eternity, and it's all ours because our elder brother, Jesus, laid down his life so that we could be forgiven and have all that belongs to him. I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a promise that is. So loved ones, as we pull all this together, it's true. When other believers express their love to us and they show this great care for us, 
We recognize that, pay attention to it, don't take it for granted. Well, of course they should have done that. Do you know who I am? That's missing the point. Paul didn't do that. He commended them, he recognized the care, and that encouraged him. But he also realized contentment, my contentment doesn't come from what you do for me, so I will resolve to be content. And I will rely on the strength that comes from only from God in Christ. I'll place, I'll repose all my confidence in Christ alone because he alone can bear up the weight of our souls. What's your next step? This morning, what's your next step? Are you experiencing this joy or does it feel like life is just all out of control? You have no joy. There's no satisfaction. doesn't matter if you're here or on vacation or wherever you're at. You just want to preoccupy your mind, but just be busy and busy and busy, but you're missing the point for which you were made. May the Lord rescue me. May the Lord rescue us from the desire for control so that I'm set free to be content, content in Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you in Christ, you provide what we could not earn and what we could not buy. You are so gracious and you are so good. Thank you for the gift of faith. Thank you for the gift of repentance. Thank you that we can hear a message like this church heard 2,000 years ago and you by your spirit can change our hearts and change our lives. It's not Whoever's here today, we're not just done and we're just not fixed and that's just the way it is. Lord, you are the one who changes hearts and minds and lives. And we trust you for that today and for the rest of our days and for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.